just when you think we're done with the Spectrum. <laughs> no, we're never done with the Spectrum. For this little video today, I'm having some fun. As has been said so, so many times, sports games and age don't mix, don't they? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to prove you on with six Spectrum games that haven't aged today. Yeah, okay, maybe they have. Really, I just wanted to put a spotlight on how the Spectrum handled the world of association football. And so I've got a couple of regular games, a couple of management games, and something that's a bit more out there. Don't expect FIFA, there's going to be some crap here, that's for sure. But, well, not all of it. I'm going to start with management first off. You may well think that seeing as football games surely require fast movement and fast scrolling, you know, the exact things that the spec is often terrible at, that the old tracksuit, bag of balls and chewing gum show might be more of its speed. And in the case of the first game here, you'd be right. This isn't just any game in fact, it's one of the Spectrum's best remembered and best loved games. It is of course Football Manager, coded by a certain Kevin Toms. Obviously it's not much of a looker. This is quite an early Specky game, released back in 1982. In fact, it was originally seen on the ZX81, but it's here where it made the most impact. This is, put bluntly, the game that started the whole footy management subgenre. Written entirely in basic, the options are quite simple. You pick from a whole bunch of teams, but no matter what, you start in Division 4, as it was then, with a bunch of clapped out has -beens. The players are real, but don't exactly match up to the team, but then, if you expected a full database of contemporary players for every team in 1982, I don't really know what to tell you. In any case, you can change every player's name, as well as pick a strip from an exciting range of colours. Black and white. You can also sell players, pick your team, you have an option to buy someone after every match, and so forth. The basic stuff you would expect, and there is a few stats too. You will have to rest players every now and again to pick their energy up, and naturally the better players cost more money. Makes sense, doesn't it? The most memorable thing about Football Manager is, of course, how it handles the matches, for indeed it does in a way. Matches take the form of various highlights, all centred around goal mouth action. The highlight plays out and you see if the end result is a goal, or not a goal. It's so bare bones, the setups are all totally fixed and that goal couldn't look more off, but <laughs> ah well it's exciting. It retains a charm, even has the excitement of a match feeling like proper end to end stuff and crucially it's pretty freaking quick to boot, a match is usually over and done within like 2 minutes. Football Manager very much has that one more match quality, which back in the day would surely turn into one more season before too long. Needless to say, it worked. This is one of the Spectrum's most successful games and by far its biggest export. You can find versions of this game everywhere, from the Amstrad to the C64, the Acorn to the Micro, Football Manager even made it to PCs, the Atari ST and the Amiga. It didn't even need a sequel for six years. This was the undisputed face of footy management games in the 80s, it was only when the likes of Player Manager and the new kin in town, Championship Manager rolled around, that it was finally knocked off its perch. Kevin Toms finally killing it in 1992 after Football Manager 3 was made without his involvement. The epilogue to the whole thing being that when Championship Manager's developers, Sports Interactive, broke up with publishers Eidos in the early 2000s, they continued to develop their game under a new name. Football Manager, and while it's under new management, it's still the biggest footy money sim in town to this day, and one of the most successful sports sims ever created. And while there may be more stats devoted to a player's little toe in FM 2016 than there are contained in the entirety of this game, it's still got something. Speed, charm, eternal youth, and the welcoming photo of the charming bearded face of the coder on the front cover. What more do you really need? To demonstrate further the gap at the time between Football Manager and everything else, here's a game that I played back in my younger days that's, well, not very good. This is Gary Lineker's Superstar Soccer from 1987. Now obviously it didn't take long for people to figure out that the endorsement of a real sports person on the front of a game sold copies, and who better than the man who would become the world's leading crisp salesman. 
This game is objectively more complex and more fully featured than Football Manager. It has more teams, you have the option to train your team, you can buy and sell players whenever you want, you even have the option to change your team's tactics before and during a match, and the match itself is a full match. However, it's god awful. Seriously. It's so easy for a footy money sim, no matter how many stats it's got, to become deathly boring, and this is. The action is just so dull to watch. You may be able to see a match play out in its entirety, but considering that virtually nothing happens during any match aside from a ball slowly trundling around a field, you'll be begging for highlights almost immediately. Even on the fastest setting, by the time you get through one match in this game, you could have probably got through at least five in Football Manager. But don't fret, there is the option to actually play football in this game too. But for the love of god don't do it. This is one of those specy games where you can only use the keyboard and the controls are located entirely on the freaking number row between 6 and 0. Doesn't it make perfect sense for left to be right next to up? And you don't even know who you're controlling. This game is just... Ugh. It's the sort of thing where you look at it all these years later and wonder how you could have ever possibly put up with it. But it wouldn't be Gary Lineker's only starring role on the Specky. The very next year there was another, largely better game with his likeness on it, Gary Lineker's Hot Shot. And it makes for a nice segue away from football management and into the world of actually just playing football. There's no management in this game. You pick a national team and away you go, playing a league competition. There's even a bit of nice music to take you there, some nice 128k AY chip sound, composed by no less a musician than Ben Daglish, he of all those awesome Sid tunes and the like. The action itself is actually kind of recognisable, in the sense that a lot of football games after this use the same view, bird's eye view going up and down the pitch. It makes me think of this sort of like an unofficial conversion of the arcade game Tekan World Cup, and naturally you would see this in the likes of Kickoff and Sensible Soccer before too long. Now don't get me wrong, this is way, way better than Superstar Soccer, but it's still a bit flawed and primitive. It's faster, but the movement is jaggy and just a little annoying. One of the oddest things about the game is that when you kick the ball using a power bar system, everything else stops and once you start holding that button, you can't actually be knocked off the ball. Power bars had been used before this and would become pretty common, but they obviously hadn't been perfected yet. The game is, well, it's pretty average. I find it quite infuriating to control at times. While there is an attempt to have realistic dribbling with the ball, the spectrum isn't very well designed for it. The computer also completely lacks any killer instinct in front of goal. I got pretty well trapped here and the opposing team decided to just cross the ball back and forth to each other in the box until the half-time whistle ran. And in the end it all makes for a very hoofy game of football. You're just hoofing it up the field most of the time and not much else. There are better early examples of similar games and alas, the presence of everyone's favourite Leicester City centre forward and match of the day host couldn't save it. I mean, well obviously it couldn't. You think that he was adding anything to the code while camped up in the six yard box at Filbert Street? Obviously not. Fuck's sake. Speaking of licensed stuff, here's something else. A football game with the endorsement of no lesser figure than Paul Gascoigne. Of course this was made back in 1990 when most of us thought that he was the best footballer in the world and everything. Not, well you know. I wondered what this would be like, considering that it came so late in the Specky's life. Perhaps it would take full advantage of the years of coding knowledge that had gone into the system by this point, and it'd be really good. Yeah. It's got a rather nice intro for a Specky game at least. In the game itself, you can face a handful of teams varying in difficulty, from easy minnows like Albania to the likes of Germany and Brazil. You play as an as yet undiscovered country known simply as Player One thus removing one of the single great traditions of playing any sports game. I'm England! No, I am! I want to be Brazil! And the one who insists on playing as Italy even though no one else wasn't ever considering it, that being me. It's what you did in the playground, it's what you did in these games, and it's what you don't do here. Minor quibble maybe, but what football game doesn't allow you to select a team? The action takes place in the rarely used bird's eye view moving from left to right. Scrolling isn't all that bad, but eh, it doesn't take long for problems to crop up. 
The colouring is strange. Is the opposing team at an advantage or disadvantage by virtue of being ghosts? And obviously they are because a lot of the time the ball just seems to go right through them. You could try and justify this with nutmegs but really, it's quite lame and is one of basically two ways to score a goal, the other being a diagonal one that will send the CPU do lally. Once you get past the intro the whole presentation becomes quite unimpressive pretty damn quick. And also, well, this is it pretty much. A bunch of teams, one single match either against the CPU or another player, there's no league or cup options at all. It's still the specy and this might not matter so much if the football was decent, but it's not. It's mind numbingly average even for the specy, to the point where it wouldn't be worth covering if it didn't have Gazza's smiling Geordie face on the cover. And no, there will not be 5 minutes detailed in the rise and fall of Newcastle's favourite son, because this game doesn't deserve it. Maybe the original Gazza's a hidden gem and it could happen then, but I can't say that I care enough to look. So forget about licences. This right here is for many the best example of football on the spectrum, and rightly so. As we seem to be doing often lately, we're going to Ocean Software and their master coder, John Whitman, maker of Specky Sports Classic Match Day 2, quite possibly the only footy game that truly matters on the system. Match Day 2 is pretty much as good as it could possibly be in presentation. Whereas just about all of these other games take place in near total silence with the odd beeper effect here and there, Match Day 2 has a constant hum in the crowd throughout. It's even got the odd bit of chanting, and the amusing whistle as a ball goes flying into the air. The game uses a power bar system that's similar to some other games here, but it's always moving so you gotta time it as opposed to charging it. And it kind of works. Match Day 2 is pretty fun at the end of the day. It's by far the best you're going to get for football on the specy. It may well still be really slow for a lot of people, and primitive in a lot of ways, but it works regardless of whether you're playing against someone else or even the computer. It's a pretty strong game from one of the best programmers of the whole decade, the guy who made Batman, Head Over Heels. I mean if anyone could have made a decent footy game on the system, it would have been John Whitman. And so he did. Now I said that I would end this video with something a bit odd, and so I shall. Our final specky football game is this right here, Peter Shilton's Handball Maradona, released by Argus Press in 1986. The only other Argus Press game I know is Grange Hill, and that was a bit odd too. Like that, it's another licensed effort, this time created for England's most capped player, a man who played in three World Cups and tons of clubs over a 30 year career, good old Peter Shilton. He is also, in case you're not quite familiar with football lore, a goalkeeper. Yeah, that's right, in this game you play as a goalkeeper. Apparently this sort of thing had been attempted a couple of times before, but I can't think of any other game that's 100% about keeping goal. Until recently most games wouldn't give you the option of controlling the keeper at all, certainly not modern ones although it was a bit more common in earlier 16-bit, 8-bit ones. The other rather odd thing is of course the name. The fact that the game was made in 1986 should clue you in that the name commemorates the event in the 1986 World Cup when the 6 foot 1 Peter Shilton was outleaped and dunked on by the 5 foot 5 inch Maradona, with the help of the latter's Hand of God. It would appear as though the game was renamed in order to mark the occasion and to shift a few more copies. On the title screen it's simply known as Peter Shilton's Football. Like Football Manager, a match in this game takes place in the form of highlights. The opposing team is bearing down on you, and you have to save their shot. If your team scores, they do it off screen, and obviously the more shots that you save, the likelier it is that your team will win the match. The set pieces are fixed as usual, and after playing the game for a while you will definitely start to learn them, but there are at least quite a few different situations that the game presents to you, plus 14 different skill levels which you have to gradually build up to through exams so it'll take a little while at least. The gimmick of playing as a goalie is, to be honest, kind of fun, at least for a bit. I've played this game a lot more than anyone probably should, if only for a short time here and there because, needless to say, it does get kind of old after a while because this is all there is. You can practice as well, but well, what's the point? You may as well just play a regular match, because if there's one thing the game needed it would have been some sort of league table, a greater goal at the end of it. But no, you just play various opposing teams, seemingly at random, an endless succession of friendly matches with no league or cup matches to speak of. It's a bit of a nothing game, and perhaps not a stable game too. Fifteen or so minutes into my recording of it, 
this happened. Remember that? Fun fact, when I was a little kid, few things scared me more than my spectrum crashing back to 48k. The shock of that white border, the screen disappearing before your eyes with those lines. It was like a sudden death, and it would make me run out of the room. Certainly made playing a spectrum look a little bit more exciting. In any case, well, I would kind of recommend trying this if only to see what it's like, as it's certainly unique compared to the other games on here, but it will most definitely bore you before too long. And that's about it. Another little specky compilation is in the books. What might the next one be, eh? Some games I just want to talk about? Some old cover tapes? Some really hard platformers? Could be any of those, really. But whenever it comes, I'm sure it'll be a jolly good laugh. Anyway, let's score a goal and rush home for chips and beans and fish and chinkers, and while we're doing that, we'll end the video too. Bye for now!